Isaiah chapter 62, I'd like to read from verse 11 to verse 12. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him. And his walk is before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. This great conference has been themed, awaiting the crown of glory. Awaiting the crown brings to my attention two vital things. There is a crown of glory which Pastor J emphasized yesterday is not a gift. It is a reward. A reward is the consequence of certain things done, certain standards met, certain finishing lines attained unto. And then also it talks about awaiting. Meaning, it's not what is immediately conferred. There is a time span. There is a period. There is a process that makes us to be able to come to the point of attaining to the reward of the crown of glory. And that shows me that the crown of glory is at the finish line or the finishing line or after the finishing line and then um, it's not the starting point. So that shows me if we are going to be able to receive the crown of glory, there is a race we have to enroll for. There is a process we have to go through. And I'd like to emphasize here this morning that if you are going to embark on the journey that will lead you to receiving the crown of glory, there is a starting point. And that starting point for me is the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you are going to be able to receive, he's the one who is making a promise. When you study in 1 Peter chapter 5 from verse 1 to verse 4, even though it shares in that context with ministers, I am also persuaded that every, every child of God has a ministry in one segment of society or the other. It could be over a family. It could be over a local fellowship. It could be over a business fellowship. It could be over a local church. I mean, every Christian has a ministry. Even though I think in that context, the focus has to do with the shepherding ministry. Maybe you're shepherding a family. Maybe you're shepherding a fellowship. You're shepherding a local church, a business, men's, Christian community, and all of those things. But you see, Jesus is the one referred to as the chief shepherd. When he shall appear, he said he will give the crown of glory which does not fade away. But my concern this morning is, before you can get to that finish line, before you can be rewarded with the crown of glory, you have to embark, you have to have a starting point. And that starting point is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'd like to say some things here concerning the revelation of Jesus Christ. I believe that the revelation of Jesus Christ is needed for salvation. It's not enough to go to a local church. It's not enough to join a local fellowship. When you read in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 47, And the Lord was adding to the church daily as many as were being saved. And so the people came first to Christ before they could be planted in the church. The people came first to Jesus before they were planted in the local church. And so it's very important that the revelation of Christ is important in today's church. We need to meet Christ before we can really find our place in the local church. So the revelation of Christ is needed for salvation. When you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
I'd like to read from verse 17 to verse 19. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world from every background, from every race, from every location, from every specialty, from every practice, every artisanship. He said he's reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Furthermore, when you read in Romans chapter 10 from verse 8 to verse 10, he says, but what saith it? The word is near thee, even in your mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the challenge to start with here this morning is, yes, a crown is awaiting, a crown is promised, there is a reward system, but you need to enroll for the race. You need to commence the journey. You need to embark on the pilgrimage. You need to meet the mark. And the starting point is the revelation of Christ needed for salvation. And so I'd like us to ask ourselves the question, have I met Jesus? Do I know Jesus? Have I received church? Have I received a form of godliness or have I received true godliness? The revelation of Christ is at the foundation of embarking on that journey or that race or that process that leads to being rewarded by the same Christ with a crown of glory. And not just the salvation point, there is a requirement to grow. Don't just enter the kingdom and stay at the door. Within the um, boundaries of the kingdom, there are great treasures to be explored, to be found, to be discovered. So don't just be born again. Don't just be satisfied to remain a baby in Christ. It is required in your journey towards the finish line, in your journey towards attaining the crown, it is required that the converts, the Christians, will grow. This is why we have what we call in the New Testament church in Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles' Doctrine. They were taught the basics, the standards the, of the doctrine of Christ. They were given the rudiments. That is, you need, you have a building site, and it's not enough to have a building site. You need to have the right building materials to put up the foundation, to reinforce the foundation. You want to have a 10-story building? You want to have a 15-story building? Serious work, strong work. I remember many years ago, a building was coming up in Port Accord, And for the first six months, it looked like nothing was happening. But a lot of building materials was going into the building site. But it looked like nothing was emerging within the corrugated iron sheets that was used to demarcate the area. Why? Because of the magnitude of the building. Because of the size of the building. Because of the requirements that will be placed on the building. A lot of work. A lot of building materials went into the foundation. Likewise, if you are going to be strong in this race, if you are going to be able to prevail in life, if you are going to be able to handle the challenges of life, you need strong reinforcement. You need great resources that will be diligently put in place in the foundation of your Christian faith. And our pastor has released a very powerful material that I'd like to challenge every one of us to read about the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, and that will help us to understand scriptures and to have the right foundation that will make you, you can now determine how far you go. 10 stories, 15 stories, 20 stories. Once the foundation is well reinforced with the revelation of Christ, there is no limit to how you can go in building a spiritual edifice for the Lord. Hallelujah. But not just... The starting point of being saved, we need to grow. We need to develop. We cannot afford to remain on the same level. One year on the same level. Five years on the same level. There must be progress about your life. 
And Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said that your profiting may appear to all. It's important that as Christians, you are not satisfied with remaining on the same level. Naturally, when we give back to our children, we want to see growth. We want to see progress. We want to see them um, take, I mean, crawl. We want to see them take the first steps at trying to walk. We want to see them being able to run. We want to see them develop in height. We want to see them develop in stature. Likewise, in the kingdom, if you are going to qualify for this crown of glory, it is important that we grow. Tap someone closer and say, we need to grow. We need to grow. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, it talks about the path of a righteous man. One who has come to the revelation of Christ, who has been imparted with the righteousness of God in Christ. They said the path of a righteous man shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians in chapter 3 and verse 18, I'd like to read here. It says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We need to know the Lord so that we comprehend his glory. Paul was not the only one who had an encounter on the way to Damascus. The other ones had a feeling. They had great impressions, but they did not come to the revelation of Christ. It's not enough to hang around church and hang around program and hang around activity. We need the revelation of Christ that will not only come, uh, provoke a birth into the kingdom, it also pro provokes a development. It challenges us to develop. First Peter, I'd like to read in context again. First Peter chapter 1 from verse 23. He says, being born again. Emmet, someone close to you, are you born again? Have you met the Lord? Is Jesus your Lord? And what's the answer like? Yes. Beautiful. That's a good starting point, but that's not a good staying point. We need to strive for mastery. We need to press towards the mark. We need to press towards the mark for the price of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So here he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of the Lord. And we thank God for Heritage Assembly across the nation and in diaspora. We thank God for the great things God is doing in this house. You don't know what you have in this house. You don't know how blessed you are. You don't know the privileges you have in the kingdom that the word of life is being shared with you. The incorruptible seed of the word of God. The word of God that is able to change our lives. The word of God that is able to bring the revelation of Christ. The word of God that is able to bring conviction to our hearts. The word of God that is able to steer the fear of the Lord. We are blessed in Heritage Assembly. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So it says here, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth, it breathes, it's alive, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord. Every time you have an opportunity in a morning devotion, in a conference like this, in a regular meeting, in a midweek teaching service, in a Sunday service, every time you have the privilege to receive the word of the Lord, it is not just the word of the Lord, they are conveyor belts for revealing Jesus. They are conveyor belts for transmitting the life of God. They are conveyor belts. Jesus said the word, I speak to you. They are spirit and they are life. When you have the opportunity to hear the word of God, make up your mind not to be distracted. Make up your mind to open up yourself, not to be a traffic warden. Oh, I wish that person was in service today. He needs that word. Oh, I wish my husband was in service today. He needs that word. Receive that word with meekness. The engrafted word, which is able to save your souls, which is able to deliver us from destruction, which is able to deliver us from corruption, which is able to reveal Jesus on the inside of us. Somebody say amen to that. He says, furthermore here, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, so as we begin to make progress, we come into the kingdom. There are things the Holy Spirit will not do for us. The Holy Spirit will do the revelation. We do the application. And it begins to show us here. 
Now that you are in the kingdom, these are things you need to deal with if you are going to make the right progress in the right direction. Wherefore, every Christian who has encountered Jesus, who is born again, lay aside all malice. Someone did something you don't like. You see the person coming this way. You change your direction to move this way. Lay aside all malice. You want to make progress. Your progress in the kingdom will not be measured by your material resources. Jesus said a man's life is not measured by the abundance of material things he possesses. Your life in the kingdom, your progress in the kingdom, your progress towards the finish line, towards attaining for the crown of glory will not be measured by your natural affiliations, natural acquisitions. Your progress in the kingdom will be measured by these qualities that you are born with the genetic nature, with the carnal nature for malice. But now that you are in the kingdom, you have been able to discard malice. Lay aside all malice. Lay aside all guile. Guile is not being straightforward. Guile is being crooked. Guile is being snake-like in your conduct. People, people, the more they look, the less they see. He said, you want to make progress? Lay aside guile. Jesus looked at the man. Even before he encountered Jesus, he already saw his genetic nature. He will not stand for inconsistency. He said, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Can your life, particularly in the kingdom, be described as one in which there is no guile? Lack of guile is a sign of progress. Lack of guile is a sign of jumping and running towards the finish line. Where is awaiting us? The crown of glory. Is there guile in your life? Deal with it. Is there malice in your life? Deal with it. You need to make progress. There is so much at stake. Pastor um, Greg was sharing with us. We are the elect of God. Something is waiting for us. But the moment you are elect, your constitution changes. Your objective changes. Your conduct changes. Your optics changes. Because you are sure, just like Obama, months before he was sworn into office, he knew he was elected. And the way he was related to, the way he was treated, the ambience around his life changed. I am sure also security personnel will have been allocated to him because he is elect to be at that time the next president of the United States. What are we saying to us here? You want to make progress? Lay aside malice. You want to make progress? Lay aside guile. You want to make progress? Lay aside hypocrisy. Bible talks of the doctrine of, 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 the, of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You can imagine how religious leaders can lead in hypocrisy. You can imagine how religious leaders will teach us this is white, but they are functioning in black. He said, lay aside all hypocrisies. Don't live your life just based on what people tell you, on what men of God tell you, on what viral social media content tells you live your life according to the word of God which lives and endures forever somebody say amen in the house amen. how do I run in this race lay aside hypocrisies how do I run in this race lay aside envy those are the things in your path that will not make you to run smoothly those are the things in our paths that will weigh us down. He said, lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run the race of life. Lay aside some things we have to lay aside here so that we can be free of encumbrances. So that we can be free of excess luggages. So that we can be free of things that we slow. If your natural body weight that makes you move with momentum is 60 kilograms, and for whatever reason, you put on additional 10 kilograms, it will slow you down. It will not make you to be able to run diligently. You will know in your mind, you have the potentials, but your anatomy and your legs will not cooperate with what you know you can do in your mind. So shed the weight. Tap some closer and say, shed the weight. I want another way to shed here. Envies. When we feel, why should other people have those things? When I should be the one having those things? When God just blessed you with maybe one million naira, you are eager to testify about it. Then someone far beneath you and talks about God's blessing of 10,000 naira and you're angry. That why would God empower this person with 10,000 naira? This person will not be coming to prostrate before me anymore. 
This person will not see me as important in his or her life anymore. Envies when you feel what went to others must come to you. Why should things go to others? Why should favor go to others? Why should life partner go to others? Why should recognition go to others? Why should promotion go to others? When it should come to you. Envies. Lay it aside. He said, and all evil speakings. I need to make faster progress here. So... He said, as newborn babes, I'm showing us from the starting point, in case you are still at that level, you may be 10 years in the faith, but you are still a baby in the kingdom. Because these things are still found in your life. You may be able to speak in tongues, you may be able to quote scriptures, you may be even able to lead the church, but God looks at you, he sees malice, he looks at you, he sees guile, he looks at you, he sees evil speakings, he looks at you, he sees hypocrisy, he looks at you, he sees jealousy. Yes, you may be a leader, but in the kingdom he sees you as a newborn baby. And so here he says, as newborn babies desire the sincere. Sincere means undiluted. Sincere means pure. Sincere means it is not corrupted. It is not tainted by culture. It is not tainted by environmental hazards. It is not tainted by, it is direct from the throne of God through human channels to the end recipients and end users. He says here, desire it. And my challenge here this morning is, do you desire the milk of the word of God? Do you desire the word of God? Do you want the revelation of Jesus Christ? Many a times one of the strongest vehicles or conveyor belts for transmitting the I mean, light to us and strength in the kingdom is the word of God. For transmitting the revelation of Jesus is the word of God. He says desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? That you may what? Growth is possible because as the word comes, you realize your carnality. As the word comes, we realize our uh, hu human limitations. As the word comes, we realize, yes, this, this thing I'm prided in, that is in my dad, is in my grandparents, I realize this is not in nature of the kingdom. This is the nature of culture. This is the nature of the environment. I need to deal with it if I'll become more and more like Jesus. Are you still in the house this morning? It says, these are the sincere milk of the word that you may grow, gain stature, gain strength, gain mobility, gain movement, gain momentum. That you may grow thereby. Quickly, and not just growth here. Evidence of growth is responsibility. I'm showing us what we close the gap between the crown of glory that is awaiting and commencing the journey by the revelation of Jesus and not just staying at the starting point, making progress, gaining momentum. The evidence of your growth is your eagerness to take responsibility. When, as we are growing in my home, I realized my mom, my parents, they used to have house help as we are growing. But my mom, when I was about eight years of age, she told me, look, the house help, is for me, it's not for you. So there are certain things you will have to be doing. But I was still also still in comfort zone. And then suddenly I realized around the time I was about 12 years of age, my mom just changed. It was like suddenly I was enrolled in a barracks. And some of those people in boarding house would tell me what they were going to in boarding house. I felt my home was more serious than a boarding house. Five o'clock you have to wake up. Five minutes past five you don't wake up, my mom will come to wake me up with horse whip. So it was ingrained in my mind that I have to be up by. So no matter what, whether alarm clock or no alarm clock, something in me triggers once it's just about five o'clock because of the fear of horse whip. She was challenging me to responsibility. Not just to grow in heights, grow, and she will look at me, but she was challenging me not that height is not enough. The academic progress is not enough. You need to be functional. You need to be responsible. You need to take responsibilities. I will come from school and then she sends me over to her shop to go and manage her business. Why? Because natural growth is not enough. Natural age is not enough. The proof that you are growing in the kingdom is responsibility. And take responsibility for your time. 
Take responsibility for your resources. Take responsibility for your lifestyle. Take responsibility for your thoughts. Take responsibility for your associations. Don't live a life that will make you have to blame others for your life. Take responsibility for your life. <laughs> and not just for you taking responsibility. Seek opportunities for responsibility. When they are looking for evangelism, people who engage in evangelism seek opportunities for responsibility. When projects have to be carried out in the house requiring finances because we don't trade in the house of God, seek opportunity with the resources God has given you for responsibility. If you are making your business to grow, you have the wisdom of God making your business to grow. God can also use, also requires that wisdom to make his house, to make his people, to make his, the things of his kingdom to grow. Seek responsibility. Don't just be a number. Don't just be on the register. Don't just be a face. Let us feel you. If I, 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 I'm not sure if I said this here last year. If we don't feel your presence, we cannot feel your absence. If we don't feel your presence, we cannot feel your absence. If your presence is just a number, someone else, another first timer, another sinner, will come around and sit on that seat. But when we feel you in singing, when we feel you with camera handling, when we feel you with media, when we feel you in evangelism, when we feel you in the prayer meeting, when you are not around, the people in your group, and as a result, the local church will feel you. Take responsibility. Jesus took responsibility. There were 24 elders in heaven, but Jesus looked at the burden of the Father's heart and looked at the disconnect between the Father and mass humanity made in his image to be regents for him on the face of the earth. He saw a disconnect, and Jesus offered himself. He took responsibility. He said, no man takes it from me. Of my own will, I lay it down in John chapter 10. Of my own will, I take it up again. He said, this honor I have received of my father. Jesus took responsibility in taking the form of a man to come and die for the sins of the world. Take responsibility in the kingdom. Don't just be a number. Take responsibility. Don't just admire those who take responsibility. Join the ranks of responsible believers in the household of God. Also, I'd like to say to us here, I've told us about the crown of glory is a reward. It's not a gift. And you see, before you get to the reward, there are three things Isaiah captures. The salvation by the revelation of Christ, the works by the revelation of Christ, and then the rewards by the revelation of Christ. Let me read that place in context again. Isaiah chapter 62, from verse 11 to verse 12. It says here, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed unto the ends of the, of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him. The crown of glory for every saint, for every Christian. Like Pastor just shared with us yesterday, Every saint has a crown of glory awaiting, for, awaiting him or her. He said, behold, his reward is with him. But before you get to him, his walk is before him. And you hear preachers of grace saying, uh, uh, I will never suffer. Jesus suffered for me. I don't believe in that gospel. I tell you, because you have received grace, you should not be walking, you should not be sweating. I don't believe that gospel. Jesus in his walk, he said he prayed until the sweat that came out of his body were like great drops of blood. He walked to attain. And Paul said, I, I, I was not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Yet the grace of God upon my life was not in vain. I labored more than they all. Who told you that life in the kingdom is autopilot? Who told you that once you get into the kingdom, everything is double-double? Who told you that once you are in the kingdom, he will just be downloading everything your way? There is a walk before him before you attend to the rewards that are with him. You want to come closer to the rewards? Show me your walks. You want to come closer to the crown of glory? Show me your walks. There are walks to be offered. There are walks to be given. Show, 
Each of those apostles worked tirelessly. They labored for the Lord. They were persecuted for the Lord. They suffered for the Lord. They left for joy because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They labored because they had the mindset, we are the elect of God and there is a crown of glory waiting. I speak over this house this morning. A crown of glory is awaiting you. Son of, son of Zion, daughter of Zion, a crown of glory is awaiting you. But before you get to that crown, the work of the Lord is before him. And as I close here this morning, I'd like to challenge us. In order to be able to make this progression, become saved, grow in the kingdom, take responsibility in the kingdom, take up the works of the Lord. Don't just take up the work of your culture. Don't just take up the work of your business. Don't just take up the work of your profession. All of those things will amount to nothing if you cannot show the Lord the work you are doing for him. Your crown of glory will not come to you because you have become a business owner. What addition, what blessings, what value is being added to the kingdom through that business? You are a political office holder. That is not what will make you to attain to the glory unless you are using kingdom culture, kingdom principles, kingdom ethics to shape, to lead, to contribute to your quota as a political office holder. God wants to see the works of the kingdom in your sphere of influence. And that is what will push you nearer and nearer to the crown of glory. And you see... So, making the progress, but fundamentally, we need to come to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I believe one vital thing about the body of Christ is that we all, in every generation, in every location, we need to come to the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus as the apostle, the sent one of God. The revelation of Jesus as the prophet. The revelation of Jesus as the teacher. The revelation of Jesus as the shepherd. The chief shepherd of the flock. The great shepherd. The good shepherd who lays down his life. Those are teachings on their own. We need to come to the revelation of Jesus as the, evan the apostle, the evangelist, the teacher, the uh, uh, prophet. We need to come to the revelation of Jesus as the son of the living God. I think I'll take that one here this morning. We need to come to the revelation of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. What did he do with his anointing? How did he handle his anointing? We need to come to the revelation of Jesus as the Lord, the master, the one with the first say and the final say. Many aspects of the revelation of Jesus and their import in our lives. But as I close this morning, we need to comprehend the revelation of Jesus as the son of the living God. And there are reasons for that dimension of the revelation of Christ as the son of the living God. He said in Psalm 2 and verse he said in Psalm 2 and verse 8, he said, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me, I will give you the heathen for your inheritance. It, and it is not just anybody who can ask, are you begotten? I claim this, I have that. Are you begotten? Have you responded to the revelation of Jesus? And so as the son of God, and how do the scriptures establish to us as the son of God? The Bible tells us when you read in Matthew chapter 3. From verse 17 to verse 18, as he was being baptized in the rivers of Jordan by John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3 from verse 17, he said, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my, no, from verse 16, excuse me. From verse 16 to verse 17, thank you. And Jesus, when he was baptized, straight, and went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo a voice from heaven so you see the trinity coming into coordination and into one singular action here the spirit descended upon him the holy spirit and then also he said this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased if someone calls you his son who is that person likely to be to you maybe a parent we may say but really we all understand here a father so he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then you see, Jesus started to do certain things. Let all the spirit went to the wilderness, tempted of the devil, came out of the, uh, out of the wilderness. The fame of him spread around. He started to teach. He started to minister. He started going about doing good. And then he went again to the Mount of Transfiguration. And in a place of prayer, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. While he had spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son. Look at that again. An endorsement. A validation. Standards were met. And the first time he met the standard of righteousness. In Matthew chapter 3, his, um, his re relation who became his foreigner. And the one who introduced him, John, he said when he saw Jesus, he said, I need to be baptized of you. Jesus said, no, permit it, allow it to be so for now, that the Son of Man may fulfill all righteousness. The righteousness that surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees. The righteousness that surpasses the righteousness according to the law. The righteousness that surpasses self-righteousness. That he may fulfill all righteousness. There is a standard the Father is looking out for in my life. Yes, I may be before you. John the Baptist said he was before me. He was preferred before me. Yet he was willing to humble himself to be baptized. So God saw that mark in him and said, this is my beloved son. A validation, an endorsement, an accreditation. But God tested him in so many other ways afterwards. So now you see Matthew chapter 17 verse 5, a progression. In Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, full stop. But now, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, a low voice saying, I mean from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, verse, chapter 17, verse 5, thank you. While he had spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son, comma, he was making progress. He was growing. He had setting aside malice, setting aside guile, setting aside hypocrisies. So God came to another higher validation point. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. At this point, he became an authority. At this point, Jesus became a plumb line. At this point, God knew that whatever people see in Jesus... And they emulate, we only make them closer towards the crown of glory. At this point, he knew that Jesus was a reliable standard. He had been tested in character. He had been tested in ethics. He had been tested in motives. He had been tested in conduct. He had been tested in prayer. He had been tested in sufferings. Though a son yet learned obedience by the things he suffered. Who says because you are a Christian, you will not go through some sufferings? Where did you get that from? Which gospel of which kingdom is that? I would have loved to also share, I mean, the revelation of Christ as the suffering king. In this season, I mean, we, we celebrate of Easter. He went through pain. He said like a tender plant out of dry ground. When we behold him, there will be no comeliness. There will be no attraction. He was not born that way. He was made that way. By the time the Roman soldiers finished dealing with him, battering him externally and internally, he said there will be no comeliness about him that we may, be, when we behold him, there will be no comeliness about him. There is a dimension. Jesus, we need the revelation of his sufferings so that when you receive a measure of that, you will know you are partaking of his nature. You are partaking of what he partook of just in a little measure. Quickly, in closing this morning, why the revelation of Jesus as the Son of God? We all need that because the revelation of the Son of God makes us to understand that God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the righteous judge, the one who can kill and make a life, the one who says and it comes to pass, the one who does not have to chase after you before he catches you. The one that looking at you, you will be the one exposing yourself. The one that when you stand before his judgment throne, you will not need any lawyer. You will, even when people want to speak for you, say, 
please, allow, you don't really know me as I know myself. Let me speak for myself. I remember many years ago as a teenager growing up on, on Liberty Road in Ibadan. There was early in the morning, I learned, I mean, that, uh, I mean, I learned that they just caught a witch, so I ran to the main road, Liberty Road. When I saw the way they were beating that witch, I ran back to my house. But I noticed one thing, even if you are here and she's there, you ask, what do you do? She will hear and begin to recant, begin to tell you everything she had ever done, all his, her wicked atrocities. What am I saying to us here? This almighty God, this righteous God, this creator of the heavens and the earth, the son of God wants us to realize that he also has a family. So that you don't just see him as almighty. You don't just see him as righteous judge. You don't just see him as the one who is able to kill and make a life. So that you see him as father. That's one reason why he wants us to come to a revelation of who he is as the son of God. God wants to be your father. God wants you in his family. So when you come to the revelation of Christ, it's an opportunity to respond so that you can be welcomed into the family of God. God is our father. And you will see Jesus himself depicting that when in John, the gospel according to St. John, he emphasized the role of the father in his life. My father walketh hitherto and I walk. Uh, the, 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 I mean, my father, my father, my father. You see a lot of that in the gospel according to St. John. So many things in referring to God, Jesus will refer to him as my father. But when you shift to like the gospel of Matthew, you see a shift as he started to disciple, he started to train, he started to equip people. He started to say, that person I've always called my father is also your father. Let your light so shine that, I mean, uh, that the world may see your good works and glorify who? Your father. When you pray, pray in this manner that your father who sees you in secret may reward you in the open. When you fast, fast in this manner that your father who sees you in secret may reward you in the open. When you give, do it in this manner so that your father, so Jesus, the revelation of Jesus as the son of God is so that we know how to behave in the family of God. We know how to enter into the family of God. We know how to relate to the, I mean to the, I mean to God as the patriarch of his family. Friends, every one of us in here, we can be welcome into the family of God. And actually, there will be no crown of glory awaiting you if you are not in the family of God. If God is not your father, if you see him as just almighty, if you see him as just creator, if you see him as just the righteous judge, but you don't have a personal relationship with him, God wants to be your father. The revelation of Jesus as the Son of God makes us to realize that what the Father, I mean, makes us to realize what the Father requires of everyone begotten or born of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God makes us to know how to live and how to conduct ourselves in the family of God. Conduct your life in obedience to God. In obedience to his will for your life. My parents had their plans for me. Having finished university and rounding up service here. My parents had their plans for me. But three weeks before my father made his offer. And his plans known to me. God had spoken to me. And what God spoke to me was diametrically opposite to what my earthly father wanted of me. So I had to make a choice. And I obeyed the heavenly father. Because I belong to that greater kingdom. For many years, my parents did not understand. For a long time, my parents, when my dad wants to introduce me, would say, meet engineer, Tunji, I can love my first son. I'll tell those people, I'm not engineer anything. I studied engineering, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I think it was in the last 10 years of his life that eventually considered and started calling me pastor. Pastor. By that time, I think I've been pastoring for probably up to 15 years. What am I saying to us in here? In the family of God, Jesus is the son of God so that he's a plumb line. You know how to behave. You know how to conduct yourself. You know how to think. 
You learn obedience. Jesus, though a son, Jesus, though a son, study Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 5, I mean Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 6 to verse 10. But in verse 8, he said, though a son, he learned obedience. And I'd like to add, he chose obedience. He had alternatives. One reason why God made us free moral agents is because in the midst of alternatives, we can choose right. We can choose God. We can choose to obey him. My time is up. But I pray for this congregation. May we come to the revelation of Jesus. Yeah. Housewife, traders, artisans, captains of industry, politicians, business people, struggling, well off, wealthy, trying to become, may we come to the revelation of Jesus. Amen. May we know how to conduct ourselves in the family of God. May we know how to behave in the family of God. May we come to the revelation of Jesus as the son of God. May Jesus become our standard. May Jesus become our plumb line. May Jesus become our standard. May we come to the revelation of Jesus. And may we receive the benefits of such revelation.